Today, nerds are cool. It wasn't always like that, though. In the 90s, when I was in high school, nerd was what someone called you right before they gave you a wedgie in the boys' locker room. There was a brief period in the 80s when nerds were cool, and then there's today, but otherwise the jock reigned pretty much supreme for most men throughout Western history. That is not how it went for Jewish men, however. Due to the influence of the rabbinical tradition, intellectualism was far more valued for them. In fact, it was the hallmark of Jewish masculinity. Not brawn, but brains made you a man. The smarter you were, the more manly you were. However, this did lead to a complicated relationship between Jewish men and all the biffs and steves of the dominant cultures in which they lived. You could feel proud of your learning, manly even, within the Jewish community, but outside it, well, that was a different story. And scientific racism of the 19th century portrayed Jewish men as soft and feminine by nature. Now, I'm pretty sure I got called a girl more than a few times myself back in the day. I was proud of my learning, but it is hard to stay proud while getting a swirly in the toilet. So back then, I got a radical idea. I decided to start pumping iron in the weight room to out-biff the biffs, to out-steve the steves. And believe it or not, well, Jewish men before World War II, they got that same idea too. After centuries upon centuries of spurning traditional machismo, 19th century Jewish masculinity flipped on its head, turning intellectuals into soldiers. Now, how did that happen, and why? And did it ultimately help in the end, when the hate mongers rose to power? That's what we're talking about on today's Short Shorts episode. I'm B.T. Newberg, and this is the history of sex. The History of Sex is sponsored by Dr. Jillian Kenny, historian of women, sex, and magic in medieval Europe. I'd like to thank our Patreon patron, Matt Link, for making this episode possible. Before we get started, I want to tell you about a truly great podcast. It's called Martyr Maid, and the first series about the genesis of the Arab-Israeli conflict is among my personal favorite episodes of all time of any show. Daryl Cooper opened my eyes to the tragedies that really spawned the animosities in the Middle East. And more than that, it made me feel, for both sides, the oppression and the sorrow. If you have yet to come to grips with the situation in the Middle East or want a deeper understanding of it, I highly recommend Martyr Maid. All right. Let's start the show. Time for today's Short Shorts. Short, 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 short. It is almost a truism that manhood everywhere is bound up with war. Almost, but not quite. Throughout much of history, Jewish masculinity was quite different from the nearly global norm. Rabbinic authorities actually rejected the military as goyom naches, or games of the Gentile. And in place of martial values, they substituted intellectual ones. As historian Melissa Raphael notes, Jewish masculinity is not traditionally defined economically by a man's being the main breadwinner, or by macho physical prowess, but by the prestige of his religious scholarship. In other words, what made you a man was how skilled you were at book learning, using your brains, not your brawn. Now imagine if that were the case in my high school in the 90s. I mean, my friends and I would have gotten all the chicks, and the Biffs and Steves wouldn't have stood a chance. If only that had been the case. This Jewish masculinity was a very different thing indeed. 
So how were Jewish men able to pull this off? How were they able to be so different from those around them? Well, it was partly because of the separation experienced by Jews in European ghettos. As Jeremy Tabor of the Hornstein School for Jewish Professional Leadership at Brandeis University notes, Prior to Jewish emancipation, Jewish masculinity was constructed within the context of the isolated Jewish community. While this understanding of masculinity stands in stark contrast to dominant masculine ideals, it did not conflict with Jewish male self-conception because Jews were largely isolated from dominant European society. Jewish men could be both fully male and Jewish within the context of the Jewish community. In other words, what he's saying is Jewish men were able to construct and maintain a different kind of masculinity by living separately from the dominant cultures in which they lived. Now, when I was in high school, my nerd friends and I actually did almost the same thing. When not in class, we isolated ourselves. While other guys were in the gym or cruising the hallway for chicks, we haunted the hidden nooks and crannies, like the auditorium stage, where no one else ever went. There, we were alone, and we were free to be who we were. And it was glorious. The problem was, for us, that we, by that very isolation, gave up any control over what others thought of us. Isolated as we were, rumors started to fly. And when we jokingly gave our little clique a name, we called ourselves the Band of Roving Idiots, we were stunned to hear that people actually thought that we had started a gang. <laughs> Nothing could be more absurd, we thought, but living apart as we did, people projected their fears onto us. And that is the double-edged sword of isolation. You gain freedom within your little group, but outside it, you become the other. And that is very much like what happened to Jews in Europe. Now, their isolation was not a choice as it was for us. The history of Jewish ghettoization was much more complicated than that and involved plenty of oppression. But it did have the same double-edged quality. It allowed Jews to be who they were within the boundaries of the ghetto, but it made it all too easy for those outside it to concoct more and more absurd rumors about them. Now, one of those rumors was that Jewish men were not real men at all. The self-presentation of Jewish men as intellectuals became, in the eyes of outsiders, a perception of them as soft and weak and feminine. It was very much like how jocks viewed nerds in the 90s in my high school. Now, as Europe progressed into the Enlightenment, and that word should be placed in quotes in this context, pseudo-scientific thinking hardened this perception of Jewish men. Scholars debated the constitution of the Jew and concocted all kinds of supposedly genetic traits that constructed them almost as a separate species. For example, historian Sebastian Hubel notes, Indices for neurological disorders, nervousness, hysteria, passivity, cowardice, as well as physical features, flat feet, small composition, obesity, and weak stature, placed Jewish men in a corner with women who were deemed to suffer from similar medical symptoms and physical deficiencies. This was scientific racism, and it made Jewish men into women. Now, this would have been a paltry caricature of the Jewish male in any era. There was never a time when all Jewish men were as nerdy or as weak as I was. But it was especially inaccurate moving into the modern era because by the 19th century, Jewish men had actually done a 180. Many of them were no longer like my nerd friends and I at all. The intellectuals had become tough and athletic and militaristic. Jewish masculinity had changed. And the culmination of this can be seen in the 1886 Manifesto of Viedrine, the first exclusively Jewish student fraternity in Germany. We have to fight with all our energy against the odium of cowardice and weakness that is cast upon us. We want to show that every member is equal to every Christian in any physical exercise. 
Physical strength and agility will increase self-confidence and self-respect, and in the future, nobody will be ashamed of being a Jew. Now, this was something new. Jewish intellectual reformer Max Nordau called it Muskeljudentum, or muscular Jewry. Like me in high school, many Jewish men decided to outjock the jocks, pumping iron in the weight room. And they did a far better job of it, too. I mean, I think I might have lasted maybe a month or two before returning to my Dragonlance novels, but many Jewish men went all out for muscular manhood. So why, after centuries, had Jewish men suddenly gone gung-ho? The reason was emancipation. Jews were looking for a way to improve their legal status and economic opportunities, and they found it in the military. See, Europe was changing. The old medieval idea of the passive subject ruled by the government was giving way to the Enlightenment idea of the active citizen participating in government. However, you didn't get full citizen rights as we think of them today, you know, the ability to participate in government. You didn't get that all at once. On the contrary, you had to earn it. And one way that you could do that was through the military. European governments in need of more and more soldiers began to offer enfranchisement, or civil rights and liberties, to males who joined the army. For example, the Austro-Hungarian Empire granted men the right to vote, but only after completing a three-year tour of duty. If you didn't do that, you couldn't vote. And stuff like this happened all across Europe, and thus the army came to be seen as a male rite of passage, a route to full adult manhood, and many Jews found this offer enticing too. After centuries of disempowerment, Finally, they had found a path to inclusion, or so they hoped anyway. Now, by showing themselves just as willing and able to fight for their nations as the next man, they hoped that full emancipation would follow, and in fact, in many cases, it did. For example, when Germany unified in 1871, it granted Jews emancipation. Finally, it was here. They had done it. And they had done it through military masculinity. And they didn't just talk the talk, either. They walked the walk. When Europe descended into the Great War, Jews answered the call. Approximately 100,000 German Jews participated in the Great War, with 12,000 killed in action. And the Iron Cross, a German military honor, was awarded to no less than 18,000 Jews. In short, Jewish men proved themselves in the trenches of World War I. Now, for many in Germany, the Great War was the great equalizer. As we heard previously, Germany went into the war divided, but came out of it united. I mean, elbow to elbow in the trenches were Catholics and Protestants, aristocrats and lowly laborers, with no one to rely on but each other, and that welded Germans together like nothing before. So German Jews had every reason to believe that it would work for them too. And indeed, after the war, Jewish men attempted to leverage their war service in the face of growing anti-Semitism. Clubs and organizations were founded to raise awareness of the Jewish veteran. One of them was the Reichsbund Jüdischer Frontsoldaten, or RJF, and the name means German Jewish Soldiers of the Front. And it was a veterans organization founded in 1919, right after the end of the war, with the goal of protecting the honor of Jewish soldiers and educating the public about their contribution to the war. Now, unfortunately, this came right at the same time that a counter-narrative was worming its way into the minds of Germans. The stab-in-the-back narrative claimed that Jews had, in fact, shirked their duties during the war and thus causing Germany to lose World War I. Now, as we just heard, that was anything but true. However, centuries of perceiving the Jewish male as physically feeble 
and this being bolstered by the authority of scientific racism, made the stab-in-the-back narrative believable. And in the face of this, organizations publicizing Jewish war contributions fought an uphill battle against public perception. The idea of Jewish soldiers was as hard to believe as if my friends and I had just joined the football team. And if we showed people the team roster with our names on it, people would have assumed that we were just bench warmers, you know, on the team but not really playing. And that, in fact, is what people assumed about German Jews, too. Hitler claimed in Mein Kampf that, sure, yeah, Jews had enlisted in the army, but they only served in behind-the-front positions of safety. He wrote, Every clerk was a Jew, and every Jew a clerk. In other words, what he's saying is, they didn't face any real danger, that's his claim. Their so-called service was actually a shirking of duties. Their so-called sacrifice was a cowardly retreat, leaving true Aryan Germans to fight and die alone. That's the story. This was the stab-in-the-back narrative, and it was a seductive story indeed. When the Nazis rose to power and started implementing their anti-Semitic hate policies, such as the exclusion of Jews from the military, followed by the 1933 boycott of Jewish businesses, the justification for all this was the so-called stab in the back. Now, Jewish men didn't just take this lying down. They fought back, not with weapons, which by that point had all been confiscated, but with words and with deeds. They knew in their hearts that they were soldiers and that they were men equal to their Aryan peers. And if they could only convince them of that, then maybe they would have a chance. So they endeavored to show it. Historian Sebastian Hubel reprinted a photograph from the 1933 boycott of Jewish businesses. Outside a Jewish storefront intimidating all passers-by stands a brown-shirted Nazi stormtrooper and right next to him, standing tall, is the Jewish owner of that store with an iron cross pinned proudly to his chest. This was a display of the virtues of the soldier. Courage in the face of fear, determination in the face of oppression. Now, of the two of them, the stormtrooper or the store owner, which was the more manly? That's what the photograph seems to ask. And that is the challenge that was posed by brave Jewish men all across Germany during the boycott. Later, in March of 1935, when mandatory conscription was introduced for men, Jews were once again excluded. And furthermore, the Nuremberg race laws of that same year denied Jews citizenship. It stripped them of what they had gained in 1871. The emancipation for which so many Jews had fought and died evaporated overnight. Jews were, moreover, forbidden to possess weapons, not just guns, but even sabers and rapiers, apparently for fear that Jews would swashbuckle their way out of oppression, I guess. Jewish names were also disallowed on war memorials and were even stricken from current memorials. And even hunting licenses were no longer issued to Jews and even fireworks would not be sold to them any longer. Now, what's going on here is rather interesting. In this stab-in-the-back narrative, Jews are scorned for supposedly shirking their soldiers' duties, not being true soldiers, and yet what these laws were doing was making them not soldiers, making them less and less soldier-like by the second. Scientific racism claimed that they were unmanly, and now by law they were being forced to become Unmanly, the Nazis were attempting to muscle Jewish men into conforming to the very caricature that they had in their minds of them. They were making them into what they thought they were. Now again, Jews fought back. The RJF responded by printing Jewish war letters in 1935 in the hopes of proving, look, see, we fought, we died, it's right here. But to no avail. These letters were seen as fake news. The stab-in-the-back narrative had already prepared people to suspect them as fakes and forgeries. There it was, right there, undeniable proof, and yet people could not see it. And perhaps it was then that Jewish men 
truly began to realize what had become of the Germany that they had fought so hard to find a place in. They had given up being intellectuals. They had turned soldier in an attempt to outjock the jocks. They had fought, and many had died, to prove themselves men equal to their neighbors. But they had not truly given up their past ways, because in all of this, the great mortal error that they had made was an intellectual one. They thought that they could reason with them. But this was no place for reason, not anymore. And there was no place left for them in it. On November 9th, 1938, they came for them. The shards of glass from broken windows gave the night its name, Kristallnacht, or Crystal Night, the night of broken glass. And this was the beginning of the end. After Kristallnacht, Jewish organizations and institutions were dissolved. The RGF did manage to remain but it was defanged, restricted to the care of war casualties and the maintenance of Jewish cemeteries. And yet, it continued in a spirit of defiance. In the wake of Kristallnacht, the RJF defiantly proclaimed, With failure, an internal emigration is now recommended. The German Jew has to experience the restriction of military service opposed upon him as a soldierly test of character in the deepest sense of soldiering, to act tightly, faithful, and trusting. What we have always wanted is now expected from us. Willingness to sacrifice, bravery, decisiveness, and readiness for responsibility, integration, and commitment for the community. In other words, the Jew was called upon to soldier on in spirit, but no longer in the vain attempt to persuade his Aryan overlord, rather to defy him. The one thing they could not take was one's dignity. Of course, even that, as we all know, would prove a difficult challenge indeed. In the years to come, Jews under the German yoke would face indignities beyond imagining. And with the clarity of crystal, it was now undeniably obvious. Jewish military masculinity as a path to inclusion had failed. In a story from the book of Genesis, Abraham attempts to prove his faith by offering his son Isaac as a sacrifice. But at the last moment, God sends a ram to take his place instead. And the parallel to what happened to Jewish men in Germany is all too imperfect. They attempted to prove their masculinity by offering themselves on the military altar, but this time no ram substitute was forthcoming. The sacrificial knife hung over them, and true dread set in. So how did Jewish masculinity change after Kristallnacht? as men began to realize just how dire their situation had become. And what about when soldiers came to take away their families? That will be the topic of our next episode coming up next week. Until then, if you like what we're doing here, you can support the show by subscribing, rating, and reviewing. You can also pledge on Patreon, where $5 a month gets you a portrait drawn in the time period and culture of your choosing. I will draw you as a proud veteran bristling with war medals, or whatever you want. I'll make you look awesome, I promise. Just go to www.patreon.com slash btnewberg. That's patreon.com slash btnewberg. All right, folks, that's it for today. I'm BT Newberg, and this is the history of sex. <laughs>